All right. Well, I am going to go ahead and get started with some of our housekeeping things. Um, and uh, so welcome to our October 2023 Kansas Local Food Systems Virtual Town Hall. Um, I'm Rebecca McMahon, the Local Food System Program Administrator for K-State Research and Extension. And on behalf of our entire local food team, I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for the town hall today. Um, we really have a jam-packed schedule. We have four amazing uh, lightning presenters that have tons of information for us. So we are going to jump right in. Um, I know that many of you have attended these town halls before, but there's several of you that may be brand new. Uh, so before we move on to that agenda, I do wanna do a quick uh, poll to help us get to know a little more about uh, you and your participation in the town hall. So the questions are right there on your screen and let me get that poll up for you. Okay, so you should see that on your screen. Um, it's just asking if you've attended the town hall before um, and if uh, multiple times, one other time, if this is your first time, or if you're not sure if you've joined one before, um, that is just fine too. So give folks a few more seconds to answer that. The other thing while we're doing this, if you could drop into the chat, um, your name and either your business or your organization that you're affiliated with and maybe your location in the around the state of Kansas, uh, that would be great as well, just to kind of help everyone get a sense of who's in the room. Okay, I'm going to end that poll. And just so you all can kind of see, we've got a good number that have attended before and several of you, this is your very first town hall. So again, welcome. We're really excited to have so many of you uh, joining us today. So our agenda for today, um, we're starting out with our lightning presentations. We have four presenters um, and our theme for today is really kind of focused on uh, food security topics and different ways, uh, different things to think about, different uh, ways to work with food security challenges. Um, and so we have Dr. Powers from Auburn University, uh, Jeremy Gehring from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, Sabrina De Rosario from Kansas Wesleyan, and Adelaide Easter from Kansas State University, all going to share with us different things that they are working on related to food security. Um, we'll cover some grant project updates. We're going to do our crunch off. Um, so again, just that reminder that if you don't have a fruit or vegetable available, um, to see if you can scope one out um, while we're getting to that point. And then we always end up with time for everyone to share um, their own announcements or discussion or updates about what's going on. Um, so that is our plan for today. So with that, I am actually going to pass the microphone over to Dr. Powers um, for our first lightning presentation. And uh, Dr. Alicia Powers is the Managing Director for Auburn University's Hunger Solutions Institute. So welcome, Dr. Powers. I'll turn it over to you and just let me know when you're ready for me to move slides. Perfect. Uh, thank you all uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I'm going to check my time to make sure I stick to my allotted five minutes. I'm always grateful for the opportunity to talk about Hunger Solutions Institute. And uh, I think I'm only, the only outside Kansas person today. So um, I appreciate the opportunity even more so. Um, so you can go ahead and progress to the next slide um, so that you guys can see kind of the, the reason behind Hunger Solutions Institute. Um, we are housed in the College of Human Sciences at Auburn University. So sim similar to Kansas State, we are the land grant for the state of Alabama. And we are an academic center here on campus uh, and you can see our mission statement is we seek to leverage kind of the collective efforts of post-secondary education institutions across the globe um, to really support innovation around food and nutrition security. Um, you can advance to the next slide. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the different projects that we have going on and how we uh, seek to impact both food and nutrition security in our work. So I mentioned we are an academic center on campus. 
And so my goal as uh, the managing director is to try to make sure we have activities happening in all three cornerstone areas of uh, an academic institution, but even more so in an academic center to make sure there's integration across these three activities of teaching, research, and outreach. Um, I just believe that center point uh, in this diagram is where all the magic happens is when we're able to intersect teaching, research, and outreach around the areas of food and nutrition security across a variety of sectors. So our mantra at Hunger Solutions Institute is that we believe hunger is a solvable issue as long as we can bring all the sectors together and move everything in uh, a similar direction to achieve zero hunger. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we have going on in each of these areas, and you'll hear me talk about how they, they intersect across the three areas. You can advance to the next slide. So at Auburn, I do serve as an instructor to both graduate and undergraduate classes. It's, I can't wait to hear from Adelaide to hear about her work as a food security scholar uh, with Kansas State. Uh, we have an undergraduate minor here on Auburn's campus, and I teach those first two courses listed there. Uh, the intro course, Causes, Consequences, and Responses, and the capstone course. Also support lots of independent courses and fellows and internships um, associated with HSI and even outside of HSI. We do have a graduate certificate. It's currently inactive. Um, I'm hoping to dedicate some time to reinvigorating that. Um, but we offer lots of graduate research and teaching assistantships, internships, I do teach a few graduate classes and I'm always supportive of dissertations and theses. And so you can see here with the fellowships and internships and class opportunities that I'm integrating the research along with uh, the teaching as well. Okay, next slide. Uh, as far as the research, we have um, kind of four areas that we focus most of our work around uh, with Hunger Solutions Institute. The first one is hunger and food access. And I know you guys are familiar with Double Up Food Bucks in Kansas. We also have it in Alabama. And HSI serves as the lead for that. Uh, we also serve as the lead nationally for a healthy fluid milk incentive project. So really helping SNAP households expand and extend their SNAP budget. We also support uh, hunger and higher ed, working with 29 colleges and universities across Alabama and starting to extend beyond and really understanding the situation of college student hunger uh, on their campus, uh, both from a student perspective and an institutional perspective. We're starting to dive deeply into hunger and food systems, which is where my background lie. Um, so looking at supply chain, rural supports and food retail, we're actually partnering with Kansas State to host the National Rural Grocer Summit here in Montgomery uh, this year. It's the first time it'll be outside the state of Kansas. So we welcome all of you to join us in Montgomery uh, in June of 2024. And we're also launching our food as medicine work uh, to support hunger and health in partnership with our children's uh, hospital throughout the state and with our medical teaching hospital in at University of Alabama, Birmingham. Okay, next slide. Um, in addition to our teaching and research, we have quite a bit of service and outreach that we do. As you can see here, our Double Up Food Bucks Alabama and our Healthy Fluid Milk Incentive are not only research projects, they also extend into the communities as SNAP incentive projects. Similar to you all convening here today, we also as HSI host the End Child Hunger in Alabama Network. Um, and it's similar to, to what you guys are doing here today. We meet quarterly in person in order to get everyone around the table and, and pushing forward in the same direction around ending child hunger in the state of Alabama. One more slide. Oop, there we go. Uh, we also host uh, a few international organizations. Uh, both of those are to the left. Presidents United to Solve Hunger is our grass tops um, leaders of colleges and universities who make a commitment to ensuring teaching research and service on their campuses around food and nutrition security. We have um, over 100 signatories of chancellors and presidents of universities uh, and host them on an annual basis in person. Our grassroots part of that is Universities Fighting World Hunger. These are student organizations across the globe as well 
um, we have engaged more than 300 student organizations that are working in the area of hunger. Some of these are recovery networks, some of them are food pantries, and some of them are simply raising awareness and educating others about this situation uh, around hunger. We will be hosting a summit at the University of Arkansas in April of 2024 and welcome any college students uh, that are on to join us there. And on the right side is the work around hunger and higher ed that we work on with the 29 colleges and universities. So while we have research projects, we also partner with those colleges and universities to make impactful changes around policy systems and environments on their college campuses. Okay, I think I made it. So that's a brief uh, glimpse into what Hunger Solutions Institute does on Auburn's campus and beyond. Uh, so we work on campus, we work locally, we work uh, nationally and globally uh, to really impact a variety of settings and sectors in order to support a zero hunger world. And I understand I'll answer questions in the chat um, yes. and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Yes, so if you have a question for Dr. Powers or any of our speakers as they go along, feel free to drop them in the chat. They can respond in the chat and then we will hopefully have time for them to answer some of those questions out loud as well. So again, thank you, Dr. Powers. And we will move on to our next presenter, uh, Jeremy Gehring with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And he's gonna share uh, some research that he's been working on related to food insecurity. So I'll let you take it away, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me here. This is my first local foods town hall, so it's great to be here. Um, I'm an epidemiologist at the KDHE. Uh, I support the physical activity and nutrition program here, as well as the tobacco program. Um, today, I'm just going to share a bit of data from a, a little project I, I performed last year that was looking at uh, relationships between food insecurity and dietary behaviors among Kansas adults, namely fruit and vegetable consumption. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and I think click three times here. I, Yeah, they were perfect. Um, so I'm gonna spend most of the time going over just the results of the study. Uh, I do wanna hit these three background points though. Um, the first is, we're probably all aware, food security, it's a problem nationwide and Kansas is no exception. Uh, according to 2020 estimates, there's over 280,000 food insecure individuals in our state. So. Um, also, uh, we know that we are not eating enough fruits and vegetables as a nation. The USDA estimates only one in 10 American adults are actually achieving the recommended levels of fruit and vegetable consumption. And third, uh, and importantly for this study, food insecurity has previously been shown to be associated with decreased fruit and vegetable consumption. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this project, this study kind of asked two main questions. First is what are the sociodemographic factors that are associated with food insecurity? And also, is there an association between food insecurity and consumption of fruits and vegetables in Kansas, among Kansas adults? And go to the next slide. Um, so to answer these questions, we combine zip code level data from the 2021 Food Insecurity Index and it assigns each zip code in Kansas into one of five uh, food insecurity categories. So category one is the lowest need, category five would be the highest need, so the most food insecure. Um, and then we also got zip code level data on dietary behaviors from the 2021 Kansas Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFIS as it's lo lovingly known. Um, so this is a survey, annual survey of Kansas adults. Um, so it's self-reported data, which is one of the big limitations of the study, but um, these are the two main data sources that we combined. So you can go to the next slide. So I won't go over all the results, just a few highlights. This first one here is just a, a chart showing the distribution of food insecurity by race and ethnicity in Kansas. Uh, it's probably a little hard to understand without studying it for a few minutes, but the main takeaway here is that we found a higher proportion of non-Hispanic Black and Hispanic Kansans living in food insecure zip codes compared with non-Hispanic White, Asian, and other races. So it's basically showing that the burden of food insecurity is not evenly distributed across um, all populations, all races and ethnicities in our state. So you can go to the next slide. So this is a table showing uh, some changes in fruit and vegetable consumption across the different food insecurity categories. 
Uh, again, probably a lot to take in, but essentially what we're measuring here is the odds um, that uh, individuals are under consuming fruits and vegetables, meaning less than one time per day, because that's frequency of consumption is how Berkus records um, these uh, data. So we're just looking at frequency, not necessarily overall amount eaten at a time. Um, but after controlling for the baseline characteristics of race, ethnicity, and age, uh, the odds ratio of under consuming fruits and vegetables increased among individuals living in uh, highly food insecure zip codes compared to those living in more food secure zip codes. So um, among our study population, we do see this association between food insecurity and decreased fruit and vegetable consumption. You can go to the next slide. So uh, additionally, the most striking results we found were when we looked at two important subsets of fruit and vegetable consumption. And these are the ones that showed us the strongest association between uh, food insecurity category and level of consumption. Um, these two subsets are one, green leafy vegetables, which we would consider to be particularly nutritious. And then the second is fried potatoes, which we would consider to be less uh, nutritious, at least relative to um, other fruits and vegetables. So uh, again, controlling for race, ethnicity, and age, we found that for these uh, uh, green leafy vegetables, we see a very significant decrease in consumption as food insecurity increases. Um, and this was even stronger than for the overall fruit and vegetable consumption that we showed in the last slide. And then for uh, particularly unhealthy, I guess, fried potatoes, um, we see the exact opposite relationship, meaning there's a very significant increase in consumption as food insecurity increases. So um, kind of as a whole here, we're basically seeing that um, there are differences in dietary behaviors and in, in levels of fruit and vegetable consumption, um, there are differences between food insecure and food secure zip codes. Um, probably not particularly surprising to everyone here, um, but it is important, we think, to uh, highlight um, the importance of food insecurity uh, when it comes to these dietary behaviors, because they really do have important implications for health outcomes. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to wrap up now. I do need to acknowledge these three people, Shannon Metz, Steve Corbett, and Babalola Fasser. They were my capstone committee when I was uh, doing this project last year as an MPH student at KU Med. Um, so thank you to all three of those individuals. And you can go to the next slide. And I know we're not doing Q&A right now, but um, if anyone has any questions after this, you could always uh, reach out at the email address here on the screen. Uh, and again, thank you everyone for listening. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Like you said, it's great sometimes, even though it's hard to see the data, it's great to actually see the data instead of, you know, just making assumptions about what we think we know. Right. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so again, questions for Jeremy can go in the chat, um, and we'll get to those uh, after the next two presenters. Um, so now I would like to uh, invite uh, Sabrina De Rosario from Kansas Wesleyan to uh, unmute, and I'll let you talk about uh, the Community Resilience Hub at Kansas Wesleyan. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for the invitation and for the opportunity. I'm here to talk about the Community Resilience Hub, which I think is the most exciting thing that's happening at Kansas Wesleyan right now. You can go to the next slide. Our vision statement is a place where change agents come together to engage urgent social issues through education, individual and collective action and advocacy, working together to nurture local and global resilience. And next slide. We wanted to start with the why. You know that Cynic says that a lot of people can articulate well the how and the what they do the things they do. But we wanted to start with our why, which is for the sake of the people, for the sake of the planet, and for the sake of our future. And you're going to go to the next, and you can click one more so that I can stay within the, the time. Um, our how is this, which is our framework. We want resilience to be at the center, and this is our framework. We focus in three areas, education, action, and advocacy for people, mind, community, and planet. We believe that what we do locally will reverberate globally, and we want this to be a replicable model 
for anyone that is looking for community resilience, and this is our how. And the next slide is going to be our what, which is a number of new initiatives that we started at Kansas Wesleyan. Uh, we're designing two new academic offerings. One is a minor in environmental justice that's going to be under social work and uh, will la be launched in fall 2024. And the second one, we are working in partnership with the Rodale Institute, and it is a farmer's training program uh, in regenerative organic agriculture. And we also work, I saw Teresa Kelly is here today under um, the Kansas Rural Center and the Food Corridor Project. We're one of the partners that are working to create a food corridor between Salina and Wichita and work within those 12 counties in, in this corridor to, to do two different things. One is to create network networking between farmers and that value added aspect of aggregating and increasing opportunities for them to sell more locally. And the other one is to use the mobile farmers market model from common ground producers and growers uh, so that we can have more mobile farmers markets buy locally and then move food to food to food insecure areas in this in the in the quarter and in the state. Um, internally we're doing a campus scan which is an internal audit um, we're asking uncomfortable questions. My students are asking uncomfortable questions like, what kind of paper are we buying? And why are we still spraying the dandelions? And why, what do we do with our food waste? Um, so that we can walk the walk and become a more sustainable campus. And then in advocacy, we started with civil discourse training, which means conversation to enhance understanding. We had a civil discourse training in August 2022 and in October 2022 and another in August of this year for students, faculty, staff, and community, uh, where we got together to um, essentially fight polarization, relearn how to talk to each other, understanding that we need all voices at the table if we want to affect change um, in all these areas of regenerative agriculture and, and food security. You can go to the next slide. This is our vision map, which is um, sort of an action plan and explains a little bit of our history. We did a lot of learning journeys in farms like the Polyface Farms in Virginia and the Rodale headquarters and a couple of farms in California. I had the opportunity to visit a farm in El Salvador where all their students spend 50 hours at the farm and then bring back that knowledge to, to any area of expertise that they have. Um, in the action area, I didn't mention regenerative agriculture farm. We have a very urban campus, but we partnered with Quail Creek Family Farms, which is a farm that started last year, uh, regenerative organic by the Rodeo standards and is the place where our students are going to work on this, those two new academic offerings. Um, our campus scan that I mentioned will eventually inform a campus sustainability plan or a climate action plan. And we know that in advocacy, we have to work at local, state, and federal levels to, to affect some change. And we decided to start with civil discourse training. You can go to the next one. So resilience is our strategy and is at the center. And what we want to increase in our community is local capacity, community cohesion, and resources. And what we want to decrease are risks, conflict, consumption, and trauma. And you can go to the next one. We want to be references in convening. That's why we have hub in our name. These are our principles, our foundation. We value each other one and all. We want to seek common ground, engage and overcome challenges together. And we want to consume less and live more abundant, abundantly as a community because we share. Um, we also want to be a hope filled response to the challenges of our time and bring the right voices to the table, respecting diversity and building community with hard work and cooperation. And we are, I think we are the rookies. We, like, we are new to the agricultural game. Um, and we want to say that, be upfront about that. And we really like the Iroquois cultural principle. We think it fits very well. That says that there are no experts. When we come together, we say that we put our minds on the table. So if you have knowledge that I can borrow, then I can use it. And if I have knowledge that you can borrow, then you can use it. And we always have something to learn. I think I stayed within five minutes. Thank you very much. We're we're doing really well. I'm I'm very pleased. So thanks, Sabrina. Again, any questions for Sabrina, feel free to put those into the chat. 
um, and we'll circle back uh, with Q&A here in a few more minutes. So our last lightning presentation um, is from Adelaide Easter, and she is uh, working with the food security scholars. I believe you are one of the food security scholars. Is that correct? And yes. uh, works with PR and things like that. So I'll, I'll let you tell more about you and um, your program. Yeah, so my name is Adelaide Easter. I'm currently a junior studying agricultural economics and global food systems leadership here at K-State. Um, I'm one of the officers um, of Food Security Scholars. I'm currently the director of stakeholder and public relations. Um, so if you want to move to the next slide. So here's our mission. Our mission is empowering scholars by fostering curiosity and community to make progress towards a food secure world. Uh, next slide. So on K-State campus, 40% of K-State students are food insecure. Um, this means that having a group that can come together to work towards ending the food and food insecurity and poverty cycle um, is really necessary um, and is really good at exposing, um, I guess, making students aware um, of this rate on campus. Next slide. So here's a little bit about our history. So this was first created in 2020. Um, the first cohort was in 2021. Um, this was a um, idea in our global food systems leadership capstone course. Um, and the picture that you see there were the original founders of this organization. Um, so now we are on our fourth cohort. Um, last year when I was a sophomore, I was part of the third cohort and I was a scholar there. And now I have an opportunity to be an officer. Um, Next slide. So here's a structure of our um, advisory team. So our officer team is called SALTS, um, Student Advisory Leadership Team. So through this, we have um, different officers that hold different roles. So we have our director of curriculum, which plans all of our meetings and what we talk about, director of stakeholders and public relations, which is me. Um, so I work with people like you, come and present um, about food security scholars and what we do, um, as well as um, facilitate uh, what we have on our social media. We have our director of engagement, which works to put together events and um, socials for the scholars during the year. And then we have director of membership and alumni. Um, they work to connect um, the scholars to our previous um, cohort alumni. And then we have a new position this year called director of research and development. Um, so as scholars, we want to be able to give our students an opportunity to participate in some sort of research if they'd like. And then lastly, we have advisors. Can you go to the next slide? So here's a little bit about our demographics. Um, so this year we have our most diverse cohort of scholars. Um, so we've opened it up to both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, so you can see we have 10 undergraduate and five graduate, um, four international graduate students, um, and we have six men and nine women. And you can also see um, that there are a lot of majors represented, not just in the College of Ag. Um, we have things like medical microbiology, social work, public health, and political science. So there's a wide range of um, majors represented here. Next slide. So I'm going to briefly talk about our first phase, which is the first semester, um, and talk about what we've done and what we are going to do the rest of the semester. So first, we have our introduction, and we talk about their why. So we have scholars come up with their reason or their purpose for applying for food security scholars and what they hope um, they're going to get out of this. Then we do a grocery store simulation, um, basically giving um, scholars a scenario of um, saying you have $7 a day to plan um, three meals uh, and they have to try and budget something that's hopefully healthy and nutritious. Um, this really exposes them to what it's like to be um, trying to shop in a grocery um, store when you don't have enough money. Um, then we just had our local stakeholder field trip. Um, we visited Cat's Cupboard Food Pantry. Um, we also went to the dairy cattle um, 
Dairy Teaching and Research Center, as well as getting a tour of the Kramer Dining Facility, getting to see different local stakeholders. Um, and then we also, just this last week, had our Global Food Insecurity Lecture. Um, we had uh, a stakeholder that we've been connected with named Masharia um, from Kenya present about global food insecurity and what um, the food system looks like in Kenya specifically. Um, and then we also are having our fellowship meal. Um, this allows us to talk about how food and culture are tied together and talk about our relationships to food. Um, we have some scholars attending the World Food Prize here next week. Um, and so for the ones that aren't, we're going to be doing a viewing for that. Um, we also have our international stakeholder reception. This will be a reception that allows scholars to speak speak with people that have some sort of stake in the international ag and food system realm. Um, then we have our advocacy event, and that is basically teaching scholars about how are you going to like advocate for like making change. Um, and then lastly, our capstone. And then if you want to go to the next slide, um, phase two, um, this is kind of different. We're kind of rolling out um, some different changes. But in phase two, we place scholars with mentors that are in the global food system um, that are maybe in the career that they're interested in. We also give them placements with different service organizations so they can have some applied learning. Um, so previous examples have been working with Cats Cupboard Food Pantry, Food and Farm Council, or even some farms. Um, and we are also doing a research component this year. So if you want to go to the next slide. So some takeaways, um, we are really looking for um, mentors um, and placements that we can partner with. Um, so I know that there are a wide range of people here on this presentation today that are working in the food system. Um, so if you have any interest at all in partnering with us, um, whether it's being a mentor for one of our students or um, helping us facilitate a placement for them, we would love that. Um, also, if you have any research ideas that you would like um, us scholars to look into, that would be a great um, takeaway for us. And then last slide. If you have any questions, um, feel free to contact our email or you can contact my personal email. Um, you can follow us on social media and then the QR code will take you to the link to the website. So, All right. Thank you, Adelaide. Um, and if everyone could give a, a virtual round of applause to all of our lightning presenters, uh, they've done a great job covering a wide range of topics today. So I will open it up to any questions that you may have for our speakers. I haven't seen too many questions, lots of conversation in the chat, um, but not a whole lot of questions. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, feel free to either put those in the chat or if you'd like to unmute and ask that live, um, we can do that as well. Give everyone a few seconds to think about it. I'm seeing lots of thank yous in the chat and uh, comments on the informative presentations. So. I, um, I have a question um, and it's probably for our Kansas Wesleyan speaker, um, but maybe others. I'm really curious about kind of in trauma informed framing of our food systems work. And I heard you mention trauma as something we're trying to avoid. And I've been thinking about it in the context of our work with our councils and, and food policy and planning work, like how we use a trauma-informed lens. And so I was curious if anybody is actively working in that space around trauma and food, or if anybody has um, thoughts on that, or or if Kansas Wesleyan, you, you said it as something you were trying to avoid, but I didn't know if there was like an active trauma-informed focus. So, sorry, that was a long question. <laughs> no problem. Um, I believe that this is one of the reasons why our environmental justice minor is under social work. Um, the social work chair is um, a trauma therapist. And one of the experiences we had when we visited the World Oil Institute headquarters and we met their, stu their farmer training program students about three weeks ago was that their experience at um, working with the land was a healing experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, we do have um, someone that is trained in trauma working uh, 
um, with us as we develop this minor. Um, I don't know if the, I think there will be more opportunities for growth um, and maybe the after the launch, we're going to have more um, opportunities to develop that side of things when the students are actually in the farm. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to say yes to your question. Hey, um, thank you so much. I think it's a really important new um, new lens through which we can view our food systems work. And I see that folks in the chat are putting information about Leah's pantry. I'm really inspired by their work. I'm so glad that the snap ed training was useful. And I'm wondering, Rebecca, if we could invite, um, I know Adrian, the executive director of Leah's pantry, and maybe if she could come talk to us about trauma informed food systems work, like if, would that be of interest to the group? Yeah, we could definitely put that on our list. Um, as something to look at in the future. So if you're interested in that, for sure, drop that into the chat. Um, I see we also had a question from Nathan, uh, and I think this could go to any of the speakers, um, but what have been some of your biggest wins for the least money and effort? You know, I know resources are always a challenge for all of us. So any thoughts on that? I'll chime in and say advocacy. It doesn't cost much to call an elected official or to write a letter or to gather a group and come to consensus. So that would be my favorite. <laughs> Anyone else have Sabrina or Adelaide or Jeremy have any thoughts on that? I think for me, it's it's seeing the reaction of our students when we present the CRH and the things that we're we're trying to do. I think we have a really positive response. Um, I was teaching this morning and I teach environmental awareness and it was the food and hunger chapter. Uh, and then I presented CRH and I had two students follow me. Let's go to your office. I want to be part of this, you know, and I think um, the new generations are ready. So this for me is the easy win. They want this and it's hopeful too. Um, I think for me, um, with our experience in food security scholars, is just like spreading awareness. Um, so many students on campus uh, previously had no clue that we had a food pantry. We just moved to a new location, which has really helped. Um, but a lot of students don't realize that maybe even they can be considered food insecure um, and maybe eligible for SNAP. And so like through education events or even just getting out of the classroom, the scholars are being able to interact with other students and other community members. And I think that's really helping them become more interested in this realm. Okay. Well, thanks everyone uh, for your thoughts on that question. And thanks again to our speakers for great information um, uh, this morning. So the next thing on our agenda, um, hopefully we're gonna go through fairly quickly. Um, I wanted to give everyone a, a quick update about our regional food system partnership grant uh, projects that we're working on. And so uh, just again, the reminder that if you wanna see what we're up to, you can always check out our website. And I wanna talk a little bit about both our fellows program and our round tables. So we've been talking about these community round tables. I feel like talking and talking and talking for a long, long time. Um, and we're finally almost at the point of getting uh, the show on the road with literally on the road <laughs> with holding these different round tables. Um, so you can visit our website uh, to see more details. Uh, this is our list of current planned locations. Um, we have roundtables all around the state of Kansas. Um, we're still waiting on liberal. I think that's probably not going to happen until January or February of next year. Um, and then uh, we've also got virtual sessions. If the in-person sessions don't work for your schedule, um, we encourage you to join one of the virtual sessions. Uh, so if you want to know who, who should attend or who should invite, what I tell folks is if you eat food, you're part of the food system, therefore you should probably consider attending. Uh, but we also, of course, want folks that are food producers or food processors or folks doing work with transportation or retail or food insecurity, food access, all of those things, um, all of those topics 
um, we're encouraging folks to attend a roundtable if you are at all able to do so. So again, check out our website for the RSVP links uh, for each of those sessions. Um, and then our uh, Local Food Fellows Program, we are almost to the end of our first round, first three rounds of uh, project applications. So our final round of project applications are due November 30th, so about six, five, six weeks from now. Um, some of the things to know that if you submitted in a previous round and were not selected, you are welcome to resubmit. Um, we've had uh, probably two to three times more applications than we've selected in each round so far. So it's pretty competitive, um, but that's good because it allows everyone to really um, hone and focus and think about what they're going to do that is going to benefit the community. Um, so if you're going to submit an application, what we've seen so far is I would encourage you to really focus on what the community need is and who your partners are. We have our, our grant is a partnership grant, so we're focusing on uh, strengthening or increasing partnerships. Um, be sure to talk about how that fellow is going to increase capacity of the food system, including access to education resources or technical support. Um, and then really think about how the project can be evaluated and show impact. And also we wanna make sure it's it's actually accomplishable in 320 hours. Um, so keep that in mind, you know, and I think we're hoping like uh, that some of our food security fellows may find, uh, uh, or food security scholars may find fellow opportunities um, in our applications as well. So we'll, once we've kind of finished that last round of applications, we'll be moving into the phase of recruiting fellows to fill those positions. Um, so lots of exciting things happening with that program. Um, does anyone have any questions about either of those two projects? Okay, so if not, you can always reach out to myself or Amanda um, and we can help fill you in if you're not quite sure what we've got going on. Um, so the next thing we're gonna take just hopefully a minute to do a crunch off. And I know some of you are familiar with this and others of you have probably never heard of this before. Um, and so our region, the Mountain Plains region of the Food and Nutrition Service um, does this crunch off challenge every year. Um, and it's to help increase awareness of both eating fruits and vegetables as well as eating local fruits and vegetables. And so the different states in our region compete with each other. And um, we're, my understanding is that we're all always chasing Nebraska. And so our goal is to try to do better um, if possible. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm gonna actually uh, stop the share on my screen so that we can have our full, um, full window open. And so if you have a fruit or vegetable, I'd invite you to turn your camera on. Um, and so what we're going to do is we are going to um, just <clears throat> all crunch together and do a screenshot um, at the same time. So everyone have your fruit or vegetable handy. Okay. So three, two, one. Everyone crunch. Mm. Okay. You don't get the same satisfying crunch on Zoom that you do when you're in person. <laughs> okay. Okay. So after that little interlude, um, we are next going to move into um, opportunities for discussions and updates. And so um, this is your opportunity if you've got something going on um, with your program or your projects um, or uh, things that you'd like to share, maybe cool things that have happened. Um, we have about um, probably 10 minutes uh, for everyone to share. Um, and so I know there's a couple folks that I've talked to already. Um, so Samra, if you wanna go ahead, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing so we can see everyone a little bit better.
Yes, thank you so much, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. My name is Sem Rafatahovic, and I'm the Urban Food Initiatives Coordinator at K-State Olathe. I just wanted to share a couple of things that are exciting. Um, we this year received a really large transdisciplinary grant um, where we will be hiring 12 graduate research assistants to help us do some urban food systems work and research. So I just shared a link if you or anyone you know might be interested in getting their master's in urban food systems and doing some research with us, please share this opportunity with them. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to share is that our biannual urban food system symposium is happening next June in Ohio. Um, it is hosted by the Ohio State University or their extension, um, but we always like to have representation from Kansas at these events, and one of the focus areas is food security and nutrition, so if you have done research or want to present anything, um, the call for abstracts is open until December 1st. Thank you. Thanks, Semra. Um, is there someone on the call from, I see Brittany, you want to talk about um, the project you've got going? Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Um, the Kansas Department of Agriculture has opened up an application period for producers of local food to participate in the local food purchase assistance program. The state of Kansas received funding from the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service for this program, and we subawarded the funds to our state's food banks to purchase local food from local producers to then distribute to those experiencing food insecurity across the state. So if you know any producers who would like to sell their products to the food banks, it is a great wholesale marketing outlet in which they can move large quantities of product um, on a routine basis and get paid in a timely manner. Um, I would um, ask you to encourage them to apply, and I will put that link in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Um, let's see, is uh, Martha or Haley from Kansas Appleseed available? I think you were wanting to chat. Thought I saw Martha join earlier, but I'm not seeing. Okay. Well, in their absence, um, or if you're able to jump on, um, they can they can put that in as well. Um, so Kansas Appleseed just released a new report about school meal debt in Kansas and how that has really skyrocketed since COVID um, or since the end of universal school meals to or a school in a year and a half ago. Um, and so I don't have that link handy, but um, we can definitely send that out um, with our recap uh, email as well. So uh, Thanks, Aaron, for finding that. Um, <clears throat> so I see several other folks have dropped um, updates into the the chat. If any of you want to unmute and share about those out loud, uh, feel free to do so. Rebecca, I would like to talk about the Wichita Sedgwick County Food and Farm Council. Go for it. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Teresa Vizi. I work in the city manager's office here for the city of Wichita. And one of my roles, a uh, new role here at the city, I've been here four months, is serving as a staff liaison to the Wichita Sedgwick County Food and Farm Council. Uh, we have launched, we are a fledgling council, uh, but we have launched, we are having our next meeting coming up in November. So I will put that information in the chat. And I do want to give a special shout out to Eileen Horn, who is on this call, new venture advisor is working with us, the staff liaisons. There are two from the city of Wichita, two from Sedgwick County to get the Food and Farm Council going. And we very much appreciate their very wise counsel and their help as we launch this organization. So I encourage all of you just to, uh, you can meet in person if you want to come to Wichita or we do have a Zoom link um, just to come and see what uh, we're doing, this brand new group, and we're excited to get going. Wichita passed and Sedgwick County passed a food master plan in 2022, and this Food and Farm Council is now tasked with making those goals and objectives and tactics and metrics coming to fruition. So thanks, Rebecca, for the opportunity to, to share. Yeah. And Eileen, I saw you unmuted. Yeah, I just wanted to, I put the link in the chat, but uh, remind everybody that the Kansas Food Action Network's annual convening is next week. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. 
um, if you work with a food policy council, if you're on a food po policy council, if you're just a fan of food policy councils, please come join. We have lots of great um, interactive sessions and that's where we build our policy platform for the coming year. So um, all, of, all of your input is really important in that process. So um, please consider registering and joining. Thanks, Eileen. Um, Teresa, do you want to talk about the KRC conference or someone else from KRC? I can. It's November 10th and 11th um, coming up soon. And we I, put, I dropped the link in. So we have um, some exciting speakers and events and we're doing a raffle this year. Um, so I'll leave it at that. If Jackie wants to add something, that would be great. Yes, I do want to add that one of the local foods roundtables will be um, at our conference on Friday, November 10th at the Sunflower Foundation in Topeka. So that is after a mental health panel luncheon. Yeah, and you don't have to register for the KRC conference in order to attend that roundtable, but we strongly encourage you to do so. Um, and enjoy the whole experience. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. Londa, do you want to talk about the workshops? Sure. Yeah. Unless somebody else has an announcement, but um, I just, I just realized the next quarterly town hall will be in January, which um, will be very close to when we do our, um, our, as some of you know, we've been doing regional foods, food, Sorry, I got to get the right terminology out. Regional farmers market workshops and uh, direct to consumer sales workshops. We've been we started those in person back in like 2014, and then um, COVID, and we did them around the state. And then COVID happened, and we went online, and we've decided to go back to in person um, this coming year. So in in 2024, uh, we're still getting the dates and locations finalized. So um, we get more information out on that soon. Um, but just wanted to let you know that we are, and, and I think we're going to have a virtual option. Um, again, we're still kind of working out some of those details, but, uh, but I just wanted to let you know that we are planning to do those um, again in um, early 2024, probably February mostly. Um, so just wanted to make sure you get that on your calendars. That'll be happening and, and we'll get the information out as soon as we have it all finalized. So thanks everybody. And if you have speaker ideas or topic ideas for those workshops, we'd love to hear that as well. Tom, I saw you unmuted. Did you have something to throw out there? Uh, since we're doing announcements, I would just like to uh, throw out um, my name and, and our project. I, I head up the Hungry Heartland Project, which is a multimedia storytelling project. And uh, we are starting our next phase next semester where we are going to start telling stories about uh, food justice and food insecurity. And we would love to partner with anyone who is interested in having their story told. So um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email address in the chat, as well as the uh, website, website for the Hungry Heartland Project. Thanks, Tom. Nick, I see you dropped about the Farmers Union Convention in the chat. Do you want to share a little bit more about that? Or You bet. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks, everybody. Um, Nick Levandusky, KFU Executive Director. We have our annual convention coming up. Uh, it runs November 29th all day, half a day the 30th, and then we're doing a pre-convention uh, specialty growers training with uh, our partner, Common Grounds, uh, common Ground Producers and Growers out of Wichita. Uh, many of you know Donna Pearson McClish and her crew down there. Uh, details are getting finalized as we speak, and I'll have more info up on our website soon, but you can go ahead and register uh, online now for the convention itself, and hotel information is there as well. You'll need to do those separately. Those do not go together. So if you're interested and want to join us, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think that's everything that I've seen in the chat. Does anyone else have any last announcements? Okay. 
If not, I'm going to go back and share my screen here again. Can I um, say one so, other thing, Rebecca? Oh, Sorry. Go for it. I was just thinking about it. Yeah, again, since our next uh, town hall won't be until January, um, we will be having um, the Great Plains Growers Conference will be coming up before our next town hall too. Um, so that's in January. Oh man, it's like the 11th through the 13th up in St. Joe, Missouri. But um, they'll, you know, there'll be lots of different presentations that might be um, of interest to people on this call. Uh, we're, we're doing a farm to school grower training is one thing that I'm working with organizing and, um, you know, there'll be produce safety trainings, as, but lots of other, you know, trainings on growing um, different types of, of um, fruits, vegetables. I know there's beekeeping and all sorts of things. So I'll find the link and put it in the chat, but that'll be early January. Okay. Thanks, Londa. Uh, so again, uh, our next town hall is scheduled for Wednesday, January 24th at 11 a.m. Um, the registration is live, so you can go ahead and get yourself registered now so you don't forget uh, to do it later on um, if you want to get that taken care of. Um, and then the last thing um, is I do have a poll, a couple poll questions here um, at the end. Uh, for you to help us evaluate these uh, round tables. So there are four questions. So you'll want to make sure you scroll down to catch all of them. Um, so the first question is simply, did you learn something new today? Yes or no. Um, the next question is just asking which topics were valuable to you. And we set this up as a multiple choice. Um, so you can um, choose all of them or none of them or just your favorites or things like that. Um, our next question is asking uh, how many folks um, you'll share something from today's town hall with. And then if you have suggestions for speakers or topics at the January town hall, um, obviously you don't, <laughs> the, the poll question is not super, super useful. What's useful is if you put that in the chat so that we can capture those. Um, or again, if you've got um, ideas for uh, topics or speakers for the regional uh, direct to consumer workshops that we are in the process of planning as well. So I'll give everyone a couple minutes to work through all of those questions. Okay, so if you're still working on the poll, that's great. Um, but again, just thank you to everyone for joining us today. We had a ton of great announcements. You can tell that the weather's getting colder and it's turning to conference season because everyone's got uh, a whole bunch of things going on. So uh, plenty of opportunities to learn more about uh, local food systems uh, throughout the state of Kansas if you're looking for an opportunity. Um, so again, thanks everyone for joining. I'll keep the poll open for a little bit longer here, um, but I think that's it for today.